Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to today's panel discussion, um, and welcome to the, the panelists, um, which is part of the Kitchen Table series. I'm Jill Hind, and I'm the Global Corporate Responsibility Leader for EY, where I lead a global program called EY Ripples, where we aim to impact the lives of 1 billion people by 2030. So today's kitchen table discussion is about what more can business do to tackle social inequality? And I think top of mind is that we all recognize that the true inclusion calls for a more systemic approach. It requires ongoing commitment of all stakeholders and significant step change. So it's effectively how can businesses, government, investors, social enterprises, all the actors in the ecosystem take a more significant stride um, in these endeavours. Um, you know, really reducing financial complexity, breaking down barriers, high perception of risk, addressing information and capability gaps. So how can such an ecosystem, if you, if you, if you will, draw on and, and support um, the inspiration from many social enterprises? who are innovating on new business models and breaking down these barriers to tackle social inequality head on in some of the, the, the most challenging environments. So now to discuss all of this with me today and a possible future, we have a great panel who I know from personal experience um, really seek to drive action oriented outcomes. So I'd like to have them introduce themselves and I'll, I'll start with Meredith. Um, Meredith, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Jill, thanks so much. It's just a real pleasure to get to speak with this group. And I appreciate um, you as well as SOCAP Global for bringing us all together. So my name is Meredith Sumter, and I am the CEO for the Council for Inclusive Capitalism. Uh, we are a global community of CEOs and public sector leaders who are committing their organizations to concrete actions that benefit people and planet as a way of doing business. This speaks to uh, what you had just mentioned about the need for new business models. This is not CSR, and this is not about philanthropy. This is about business leaders rethinking how to do business so that as they pursue profit, it is to the advantage of people while protecting um, the planet. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Thank you, Meredith. And um, Alexandra from SAP, thanks for joining us today. We'd love a little introduction from you too. Thank you, Jill. It's so nice to be here with all of you. Um, it's a real pleasure. I feel very honored uh, to be joining this panel. Uh, my name is Alexandra van der Ploeg. I head up corporate social responsibility globally at SAP. Uh, we're a global tech player um, who are based in, in Europe. We have our headquarters in Germany. Um, and, you know, we've been working in the space of social entrepreneurship for over 10 years. Um, and um, it's been quite fascinating to also sort of see how that has evolved. And I'm just really looking forward to the conversation with all of you today about this topic. Thanks, Alexander. And Yasmina, um, over to you. Thanks from Acumen. Thank you so much, um, Jill, and thank you for having us. Um, it's just great to be here with colleagues and friends. Um, so I'm Yasmina Zaidman. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer at Acumen. Uh, we have been uh, investing in and supporting social enterprises for 20 years and really share that same belief that they are going to be a catalytic part of how we develop the new models um, to make business more inclusive and sustainable. And we've also been able to support emerging leaders. So we think a lot about leadership and this broader ecosystem of voices and participants in a big shift uh, that's going on across the business world, but that really needs to touch every sector. Um, so thanks for including me today. Thank you, Yasmina, and, and really welcome. And Jawad, it's it's actually just a, the next perfect step to introduce you, and, and thanks for joining us. We'd love an introduction. Thank you, Jill, and uh, uh, hello to everybody from Pakistan late night. Um, looking forward to this uh, conversation. Uh, again, my name is Jawad Aslam. I'm the founder and CEO of Ansar Management Company. Uh, we're a social enterprise that focuses on building housing and giving access to housing we're the bottom 40th percentile of the population in Pakistan. So we've been around since about 2008, um, and we're uh, going strong, and we're in the process of scaling up now. Wonderful. 
And, and Jawad, I'm, I might start with you, and, and this certainly is a kitchen table um, serving across multiple time zones, so it's wonderful to have everybody um, present today. I think, um, Jawad, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you've, you've built a business really from, from the ground up. Did you always set out to, to run an inclusive business? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. When I when I think about that, I think that you know, my journey started from the, the U.S., where I was uh, uh, basically working with um, developers who were building, you know, half a million to million dollar houses in the uh, suburbs of D.C. Um, and I quickly decided this is not what I want to do. So I packed up and came to Pakistan uh, in about 2005 uh, and ran into a development that was actually an early investment of Acumen Fund. Uh, and at that time, they were focusing on affordable housing. Um, so when I started working there, I quickly realized that this is something I want to do, but the nonprofit model is not going to work. If I really want to scale this, I've got to take it to a for-profit. Um, and at that time, um, we were uh, had great aspirations. I think I came in with this sort of uh, sort of puritanical approach that I want to really be a hero and champion for affordable housing um, and quickly realizing that, hey, um, uh, the way to do it is not just to be overly focused on affordable housing, but to have a more broader view. So if I look back at the Jawad from 2006 and, and now 2021, it's a very different perspective. And the perspective is something that I look forward to discussing in, in the conversation today. But it's essentially about how we need to balance ourselves and not uh, have this what we find, at least in, in our space, is a holier-than-thou approach about how we're doing things right, and maybe the corporate world doesn't know how to do it. I think it's got to be more of a balance about how we look at each other and we actually encourage uh, the corporate sector to take a lead on this uh, on this subject, especially in the, in the case of affordable housing. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it is about this ecosystem of, of collaboration and and certainly in in you know the the story you've shared and the journey you've been on um Jawad I mean you you've had to overcome a number of of challenges in setting up AMC and and the, the tensions that you've experienced I, I think it'd be lovely just to hear you know just some of those challenges and and you know how you've had to make trade-offs essentially you know and and to partner to start actually bringing um your vision to life yeah so our Again, our journey started again um, uh, back in 2008 uh, when Acumen invested about $300,000. Um, and now, again, about 15 years later, we're looking at $30 million that we brought in yeah. for affordable housing. And it's a sector that doesn't even exist in a place like Pakistan in an organized manner. So um, uh, learning, there's a long list of what we've, the tensions we've had to navigate and, yeah. and the trade-offs. But I think the main thing that I would say is Really, essentially, it's this, my first mistake was this mistake about saying, hey, I want to just serve the, the poor um, and not realizing that that I need to take a step back and say, uh, what is the best way to do that? How can I actually serve or get access to housing for those that are underserved? Uh, is it by having this sort of, you know, blinders on and just say, this is the only way it can be done or opening up my mind and saying, how do I invite others to come to this space? And by others, I mean mainstream developers and housing. So I find myself 20 years later, rather than doing anything, I spend most of my time trying to talk to other developers. In a place like Pakistan, you have developers who have enough wealth to keep their next four generations completely safe and not worry about working for one day um, and just convincing them that for once, take a risk on the... Um, the profits that you normally get, which ends up being something like 50, 60 percent annualized and come down to something more reasonable, like 15 percent and try to target the lower income segments. By that way, you're actually impacting society in a much more deeper way by having some sort of impact. By It's a game changer by getting somebody in the lower income segments to become a homeowner. Uh, the, the real impact in a place like Pakistan is intergenerational mobility. Um, and that's something that I've learned that we've. So we come along and somebody comes back and says, hey, you were supposed to you know, serve the, the low income segment. I said, yeah, I'm doing it better now than I was doing in 2006 because I've taken a more nuanced and uh, balanced approach um, mm -hmm. rather than, um, you know, saying. And so some might say that this is, a, uh, you know, I've, I've sold my soul or I've, I've lost my focus. And I think uh, I would tell them that it's just a more pragmatic approach as we look forward to grow. 
Absolutely. And I think your point about, you know, this is seen as a maybe an investment opportunity and a different way of looking at risk. And I think it's a it's almost a nice segue to just to hear from you, Yasmina. Um, you know, just I'd love to hear your perspective. You know, as a as an impact investor, you know, you kind of recognize this interplay and in, in some of these attentions that, that you may experience with some of the investee companies and, and maybe in your organization itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's wonderful that Jawad can be with us to kind of share this story because I think that 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 story really captures the journey that we've been on. You know, our focus is on finding companies that can solve the problems of poverty. Um, and that's always been a guiding principle for us. Um, it, it isn't just impact first, it's the poorest and most vulnerable first. Um, and so for us, thinking of investing as a means, we then have to get a lot more sophisticated about what does that mean and how does our investment lead to future investment, right? How do we build scalable models? How do we build role models for the world? Because at the end of the day, the scope of the challenge really requires that. So for us as an investor, I think we've really had to think about what are those guiding principles that we develop? And we had the, the fortune, I think, having done this for 20 years of being able to hone in on the practices and the decision-making tools that allow us to make investments that really, again, not just deliver impact, but create scalable impact and models for the world. So a lot, a large part of that is being able to look at the spectrum of capital, right? What's the kind of capital for an enterprise at different stages of growth? How do you attract other investors as they grow? How do you help de-risk investments while still creating sustainability and accountability? Um, and I think one of the things that we've come back to again and again is investing in character, right? Because the, the pressures of living in a shareholder-based economy um, are very real. And so in order to use those tools effectively, we have to think about who we're supporting, who we're investing in. Um, and we've been reminded of that time and time again. And frankly, just, I think, learned so much from our relationship with Jawad over so many years, seeing the way that he makes decisions to make sure that his company is delivering that impact for vulnerable people, um, I think has shaped a lot of how we think about working with entrepreneurs and finding those companies that are really going to deliver an inclusive model um, with both the scale, but also not getting sidetracked and saying at the end of the day that growth or profit margin is more important than the social impact that they started out with. Mm. And, and, and I mean, building on that point, um, Yasmina, around, you know, partnering with with corporations, you know, to to create these connections and facilitate knowledge sharing, because also a lot of this is about new business models and new innovations. And, you know, I think, as we said early on at the onset of, of the panel is it is about and, and your point, Jawad, around, you know, partnering with corporations. It's, it's an investment opportunity. It's it's not seen as a philanthropic effort. You know, how do you facilitate that um, Yasmina, and, and, you know, what have you learned through this work? You know, there, there, there's naturally some some challenges and tensions along the way as well. So kind of what would you recommend in yeah. this process? Well, we're, we're absolutely interested in changing the, the, the way the world does business, right? So these are meant to be models. And we ask ourselves, you know, what is the path to scale? For some enterprises, they will directly engage customers and they will meet those needs at scale. We have companies that have reached over 100 million customers. But for many, the way they achieve that scale and impact will be by influencing and changing business practices and, in fact, partnering with corporations. So we've just finished a report on corporate-ready social enterprises that are helping traditional larger corporations embed inclusion and sustainability in their core business by working directly with social enterprises. And as you said, Jill, not through just CSR and philanthropy, which can be incredibly catalytic, but also through their supply chain and through their procurement, looking at a much larger pool of capital that could be available through corporate spending and a great way for corporations to bring that inclusion and sustainability right into the heart of their business. So we know that it's hard, um, but we actually think there's a lot of misperceptions about how many social enterprises are out there who have prepared themselves to deliver quality, scale, and really measurable, tangible impact that can help corporations meet the commitments that they have. Um, so we'd encourage people to check out Corporate Ready because we've found you know, over 100 stellar examples of where this is happening. It is not a dream, it's a reality, um, and we hope more folks will really jump on board. Fantastic, and I, I think that's almost a nice um, lead on to, to just hearing from Alexandra, your your point of view, you know, I mean, SAP you know, is one of the corporates that 
acumen and indeed EY are, are working closely with on this agenda. So maybe talk to us about why and how SAP is really increasingly focused on on tackling social inequality and and you know across all aspects of the business. You know, naturally recognizing the challenges along the way. Mm -hmm. I, you know, listening to Javad and to Yasmina, what I found interesting is that um, they very much highlighted the aspect of this being a journey um, and that where you started off from maybe 10, 20 years ago is not where you are today. And this was the same is true for us as well. Um, you know, when we started our sustainability journey in general um, and took it more seriously, that was about in 2009. Interestingly enough, it immediately went hand in hand with um, looking at the social enterprise sector. Um, but frankly, at that time, it was, it was based on a direct investment that we were making in the social enterprise incubator uh, in Haiti. It was right after the earthquake in Haiti. And we were working with Professor Yunus to build up this. We wanted to build up an infrastructure for social business in Haiti, um, ran into a lot of challenges. Frankly, at that time, we knew absolutely nothing about social entrepreneurship, that we knew nothing about the sector. Um, it was basically this catalytic moment that, uh, that evolved um, through meeting with Professor Yunus and, and our then CEO. But it was a starting point. And what happened afterwards is that there was a small group of people within the company who started to see um, the, uh, how incredibly valuable working with the social enterprise sector could be for the company. But I'll be very honest with you as well, that in the first years, it was a CSR-driven initiative. Um, it wasn't integrated into the business. We had a really hard time explaining to business leaders what a social enterprise really was um, and why uh, it would make sense and what the business value would be uh, by partnering or entering a business relationship with social enterprises. And that was about, I would say, a good five, six years. And what we were doing from our end at that time, because we believed so much in it, we invested in capacity building, right? And we we invested in building partnerships and networks. And that's how we met um, such incredible organizations like Acumen. And the other thing that we just really realized in that time as well, and that is something that, that persists until today, I strongly believe that SAP is a company we are not the experts when it comes to social change. We have other expertise. We have other core competence. It sits obviously with technology, but our expertise does not, does not sit with social change. Um, and one, once we were able to demonstrate to the business that that expertise was sitting with social enterprises and how social enterprises could create value and benefit to the company to achieve our sustainability goals, that's when things started to make sense, right? That's when things started to click. And when it started to really click is when we started looking into the whole topic of social sourcing and social procurement. But again, this is not something that we, we thought of, right? We, we went like, oh, let's start looking into social procurement. Um, it was our partners in the social enterprise space um, who were talking to us about it, explaining the business case about, to us, um, and us realizing, you know what, this actually makes a lot of sense. Um, so the the change or the innovation and the drive um, came through our partnerships in the social enterprise sector. Today, the focus is heavily on social procurement and social sourcing, and the business gets it. They understand that this is an incredible opportunity um, for us to unlock significantly more investment for environmental and social impact than what we can do through philanthropic means only. Um, they also understand that this is a way, partnering with the social enterprise sector, is a way to make sure that our value chains become more responsible, more inclusive, and actually also less fragile. And I think if there's one thing we all learned during COVID-19 is that our value chains are incredibly fragile. Um, so, and then the third piece of it there's another business aspect for it, and that's technology. We're not just looking at it from an SAP perspective and how we can change our procurement spend, but we're looking at how we can enable our customers to diversify their supply chains through SAP technology. So all of the pieces have been starting to come together, um, and now it's sort of become an initiative within SAP 
that touches procurement, the sales organization, the development organizations, and also CSR. Mm. And so would you say it's becoming a lot more infused as, you know, a- along the journey? It's it's Because um, that's a wonderful example, and I'd love to get uh, Jawad's perspective before I get yours, Meredith, just around, you know, the, the partnering that you've undertaken, Jawad, in building um, your business. You know, have you, you know, the, the tensions I think have been pretty, pretty hard going in the beginning, but are you seeing a lot more appetite, um, you know, just drawing on the example from, from Alexander as well? Yeah, I mean, I find it very interesting what Alexandria is saying, because uh, that would be my first question is like, let's see, let's talk about what's working and what's not working. In a place like Pakistan, um, uh, we've come a long way. Uh, again, 15 years ago, when I would talk to people about social enterprise, they would say, wait a minute, stop, 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 stop. Um, Let's talk about maximizing profit, and let's talk about charity. Don't mix these things up. And um, I think we've made quite a bit of progress in the last 15 years in a place like Pakistan, where people are now understanding what this broader context means. Um, what we try to set the example, uh, one thing which we've done, um, you know, one of the, the things that I believe and I look forward to hearing from the colleagues here is that, you know, we have an employee benefit trust. And so uh, 41% of the company is owned by the employees. Um, and that means everybody from the CEO, myself, all the way to the, let's say, the janitor, and everybody in between has a stake in the company. Um, how does that play out? Um, or why does that play out? I think um, it goes back to what Yasmina saying about leadership. Um, I am somebody who gets paid uh, slightly, I don't say under market in Pakistan, but when I look at uh, our people who are getting paid above minimum wage, uh, they would have to work four years constantly without taking a break to be able to earn what I'm earning in one month. And it's, it just doesn't sit well with me. Mm-hmm. And uh, how, do we, how do we create some equity there? How do we create some, some justice there in this? Um, and one of the things we came up with was let, let's try to create this employee benefit trust where everybody is getting some sort of stake in it. And, and by, uh, by way of displaying to others, hey, this is an option. I'm not suggesting everybody does 41%. We have good shareholders who understood and encouraged and supported what we wanted to do. But taking a step towards really just looking at, sometimes we look about the broader ecosystem and forget about our employees and how we're really going to be doing justice to them. And how do they make their, their, their ends meet at the end of the day? Right, so it's just some something that we we're constantly thinking about and trying to also demonstrate to the corporate community in Pakistan. That's that's yeah, that's a that's a a great point to reflect on, and I'd I'd love to get Meredith your your thoughts. You know, I mean, I think the you now the council is really starting to drive you know system change, but I think that's a it's a it's a great example of Dawad around you know the 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 um, initiatives that corporates can actually undertake. And what are, what are you seeing in terms of how business is coming together and partnering? No, great, great question. Thanks so much, Jill. I, so I, I think first and foremost, systems change really starts with the, the individual actions that companies are taking. It, it takes, it starts with our agency as, as business and public sector leaders. And this is the journey that um, our colleagues here have, have spoken about um, and in that, I think we need to keep focusing on progress, not perfection. So when the council launched in, in December of last year, we had 25 CEO-led organizations um, who were focused on how do you take a, a business and make it a tool of inclusion as you are pursuing um, your profit. Uh, and we now have over 150 CEO-led organizations making north of 400 concrete, measurable uh, commitments to actions that they're taking uh, to make capitalism more inclusive. So we invite all business leaders to join us in finding ways uh, for our economic system to serve our our greatest and most powerful natural resource, which is really our our people. Um, So in that, you you ask about systems change. And in that, I think we have to to ask um, all of our companies and leaders to rethink their business models so that inclusion and ESG is woven into that strategy. And I think, you know, Alexandra has spoken a, a bit about that. Yasmina, I was um, struck uh, by the way that that you spoke of, of this as well. And how do you not just impact, but scale the change um, that is, is needed? 
it really starts with the companies understanding how their value creation can lead to or enable broadly shared prosperity and more dynamic economies and societies to get away from that fragility um, that we've been we've been speaking about here. This work is not prescriptive, and, and it's really it's unique, Jill, to to the company. So each member they bring their own ideas and they take action that aligns with their particular business model, their industry, you know, their market characteristics. Um, and, you know, for us, it's, it's the actions that our leaders commit to that makes them a council member. But what was missing and the role that the council is working to fill is the sharing of these best ideas and inclusive practices uh, that companies are taking. So our, our CEOs, before they joined the council, in many ways, they were working in silos and they would be trying different business models or, or trying different things. Uh, to see how they can create value, not just for for the company, but in a way that is uh, positive for for people and for for planet. So, when we're asking them to rethink their model and to donate their their best ideas and actions for this, what was missing was a platform where those leaders can share um, their actions, share their innovations, and learn from the actions and innovations that their peers are taking, whether it's within their same sector or across sectors and geographies. So it's really, it's the individual actions at scale that I think will bring that systems change that we need. And to scale, we need to disseminate access to those best ideas and and innovative practices. Um, And this is particularly important, I think, for business leaders in developing markets that um, are experiencing or will be experiencing high levels of, of growth in onward years and their decisions will have great bearing on the trajectory of their local and regional economies. You know, but it's also, we talk about the value chain here, it's also very important for CEOs who are leading mid-cap or smaller companies. So for many of these leaders, uh, they they are looking for like a central repository of the best in class inclusive capitalism practices that will help drive value for, for their companies. They may not be the early innovators as some of our industry leading members are at the council, but as they see those best practices take shape and they see the action that the council members are, are, are taking, they will be the early adopters of those proven inclusive business practices and their actions uh, we hope will, will impact others. No, that's a great point. Sorry, go ahead, Joanne. Yes, I was going to Meredith, say. that's uh, really insightful. My, my, my question is that the 400 CEOs that you have, um, how do they, I would imagine there must be some support group now afterwards where they have to answer to their board members like, wait a minute, we hired you to maximize profit going back to the basics. And here you are pinning around with these, these, these softies. Um, you know, you need to either straighten up and show us whatever you're doing is really affecting the bottom line or you need to start looking for another job. Um, is that changing or it's a sort of a very basic question, but I would be interested to know how is that working out and what, what are these 400 CEOs giving you guys as feedback? So I, I think I think the way that that markets are valuing companies that are putting ESG at the core of their business strategy, we're still in the early stages of that. But I, I do think that that is uh, beginning to, to change. And when you have a business model that is creating value, is creating profit for a company, but is doing so in a way that creates stronger and more dynamic economies and societies while reducing their carbon footprint, for example, that's something that I think um, shareholders and stakeholders can all be be proud of. We see that now, uh, and I think most strongly in um, uh, in how markets and investors are beginning to value uh, companies that have sustainability strategies more so than their peers that have not been taking climate considerations seriously. So. I do believe that we're at the very beginning stages in our post-COVID environment, that markets are beginning to wake up to the fact that you've got to also find those companies who are leading uh, in creating value in ways that lift up um, people in uh, across uh, uh, our communities, uh, people who are able to utilize their talent. Uh, and that is something that uh, perhaps not this year and perhaps not two or three years down the road, but I think increasingly, Uh, you will see markets reward those companies that incorporate inclusion into their business practices, seeing them as a tool for stronger and more dynamic um, companies, as well as stronger, more dynamic um, contributors to the societies that we're all striving for. 
And Yasmina, what are your thoughts on that? I think those are some great points that, that um, Meredith is raising. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I really appreciate the idea that there is a need to share knowledge to accelerate this process. I think we've seen evidence that there's strategic value in building more inclusive business models. Uh, we've seen some companies uh, benefiting financially. There's data and evidence and even anecdotal examples that show why this can be an advantage for companies, but the change isn't happening fast enough. And I think this idea of creating that space to accelerate learning, to create the right structures, um, and frankly, to reward that kind of leadership, because at the end of the day, I think it does sometimes lead harder conversations with a board um, to explain why someone's thinking a few steps down the road at the real risks that we face, not just the immediate short-term financial risks. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to share is that for Acumen, you know, this concept of inclusive business feels so close to the work that we've done, but we realized ourselves that we'd never really examined exactly what that means beyond focusing on the poor. So we did this project with EY, which was really helpful to kind of define what is an inclusive business and what does it mean to center the poor in every aspect of your business? Because for us, when we started, we looked a lot at the products and services and who was buying them. But to Jawad's point, you've got to look at your employees your governance, even investors, and how are you building a more inclusive ecosystem? Uh, so our inclusive business playbook, we hope can provide that. But ultimately what we realized for ourselves is that the work we've done for 20 years hasn't really been about investing. I think our capital has been valuable, but it's creating this laboratory for innovation and then being able to talk about, you know, what did we learn about resilient agriculture, about renewable energy access, about workforce um, and creating a more inclusive workforce so that's very much what we're trying to figure out. And I think it really mirrors what we're seeing with Meredith's work, but on the social enterprise side. So that, that those models are out there, both on the corporate side and the social enterprise side. And hopefully moving forward, we'll have a whole universe of models of where they're working together and how they're bringing their various assets together to drive this bigger transformation. Mm. That's a great point. And I think, Alexandra, you can speak a bit from a, a corporate perspective as well, uh, what you're seeing, the challenges and how you're overcoming some of those. Yeah, I, I think I, I loved Meredith's uh, point when she said progress, not perfection, right? Um, because um, I think sometimes you can get really bogged down in trying to figure out the right strategy. <laughs> um, and then you spend a lot of time talking about it, creating action plans, but then no action is taking place. And what has worked for us really well is to actually just put a stake in the ground. And say, okay, this is what we what we're aiming to do, and we did that in on the social procurement space with our initiative five plus five by twenty five, and basically means we're going to shift five percent of our addressable spend towards social enterprises and five percent towards diverse suppliers by twenty twenty five. Now, do I believe that we will truly get there? Probably not. It's an aspiration, but it gives us a sense of direction. It gives us this north star that tells us. Here are all the things that we need to do. If that's where we want to get to, here's all the things that we need to do. We need to change our procurement practices. We need to change our policies. Um, we need to um, invest in capacity building for social enterprises. We might need to invest in market development um, in certain countries because the social enterprise tech sector might not be as mature yet. And, 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 right? So there's a lot of things that you can work backwards from. Um, so sometimes I think it's, it's important to do that, right? So to put that stake in the ground. And the second thing is there's always so many challenges that you can face, but if you build up allies and you find your allies, not just internally, but especially externally. And some of us were already talking about that a little bit. We have learned so much from all of the partners, um, that we've been engaging with in the last 11 years. They've inspired us so much. But we're also learning a lot from other corporate players. You know, we learned a lot from EY. We've learned a lot from Unilever, from IKEA, just sharing practices, but actually going beyond that. I think what I find really exciting at this point in time where we're at today is that corporates aren't just engaging with each other to share know-how and to share learning. There's a real desire to drive collective impact through collaboration um, and to you know, to look at where do we share values? Where do we share goals? 
Um, and to add flexibility and a bit of agility into the mix to look at how can we truly come together, bring our core competencies together and create what Paul Palman always says is one plus one is 11 and not just two. And that's a great point. And I think, you know, just before we close, uh, Meredith, you know, you, you, you often at the heart of some of the CEO discussions and the pulse of the CEOs, you know, collectively would just love a perspective there on the role that they're playing. Oh no! Thanks, Jill. I, I just want to to say again, Alexandra, you're absolutely right. This is this is about an ecosystem of collaboration um, for us to see the progress that we need. And and in that, for those individual companies, the role of the CEO we see is absolutely central to a company adopting inclusive business practices. You know, the, the companies that are active in this space have leaders who exert leadership in two directions. You know, first you must you have to guide the companies um, and push against perhaps the organizational inertia to do business differently. And then you also have to manage your boards on the, the worthwhile trade-offs that come with putting people and sustainability at the core of a business strategy. So the CEO, if they really have to make the business case to their employees, to their, to their stakeholders, to their shareholders, uh, going back to Jawad's point on why an inclusive business practice is the right way to go will make a stronger company a more profitable company over the longer term. And that's not always an easy place to be. I mean, it speaks to the character that Yasmina spoke of earlier. It, it takes courage, it takes vision, it takes creativity, it takes a willingness to learn and make mistakes. And also it takes a great deal of grit uh, to see these changes through. So the, the, the work of this work of building inclusive businesses, it's not easy, but it is so rewarding. And, and that's why we created the council to be this community for leaders to learn from one another, to be inspired and motivated and challenged by the ideas and actions of their peers to come together and collaborate around key uh, inclusive capital reforms and for each member to do their part and part of this broader change that we need. Excellent. Um, Jawad, did you have a final comment there before we close yeah. this really thoughtful session? Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I would think that uh, when we look towards uh, what can be done uh, now moving ahead, um, I, I would like to share an example. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Acumen had come in when nobody wanted to invest in a company like AMC. They put in $300,000. Um, fast forward uh, about seven years later, uh, a huge real estate giant in the UK worth uh, about four billion pounds came in and bought out Acumen stake. What they did was they didn't want to come in early and, and, and take, take, take a risk, but they saw the company had come along a bit, and now they've, they've come in, they've bought 25%. They've really helped us come up. They're a real estate company, but we're just a fraction of what they are in terms of value. But in terms of action, they treat us just like a part of them and as a part of their, their mandate. And they've come in and really their, their board member comes in as very active and very, very aggressive in terms of getting us to where we want to get. And I think that that's one aspect, sitting here in a place like Buxton, we see somebody wants to do something and uh, in the real estate sector, this, this entity took this step. Uh, and I found it to be something very unique that is not very common with big corporates. Yeah, and that's a, that's a, a great example. And I, I think it, it resonates with me, even in the story that you shared in our, our playbook, Jawad, around where most saw a need for charity and you saw a need for an investment opportunity. And then it's this tremendous opportunity to collaborate and, and partner in this ecosystem approach. And I, I love the lasting sentiments of, of it about being progress, um, you know, but not perfection. I think, you know, I think that really resonates, I think, with this discussion today. So um, I really want to thank everybody, Alexandra, Yasmina, Jawad and, and Meredith it's been such an insightful session and I, I think I encourage listeners to visit the council's commitment platform and to see the action frameworks and to use the, the, the inclusive business playbook and and you know we'll be sharing insights along the way and we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear from, from you and your thoughts and, and thanks for a really um, fantastic discussion and hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you all. <laughs>